tonight. I'm absolutely delighted that Jackie Higgins um, is here to talk about her new book, Sentient, what, what animals reveal about our senses. I knew that the, the subtitle changed um, in the not too distant past. So um, I think <laughs> when I got the first thing, it was different. But Jackie is a, um, a writer and a documentary filmmaker. She's done um, numerous wildlife films and written three books about photography. Um, Sentient, this book, is her first book of, of this kind. And just to give an overview of the kind of questions that Jackie's asking, it is largely looking at the question of what is sentience. And in order to help us to answer this question, she is looking at the ways in which scientific explorations of animal senses or non-human animal sense world can actually reveal things about our own sense world. So it is a work of popular science of, you know, just a, a, a really compelling kind, full of brilliant stories, anecdotes, um, renegade scientists who are often excommunicated from their communities for their heretical views before eventually people realizing that they actually had it right all along. Um, extraordinary animals of which I probably only knew about two or three. So amidst the bloodhound, the cheetah and the common octopus, there is also the peacock mantis shrimp, the spookfish, the star-nosed mole, the giant peacock of the night, the trash line orb weaver, and there you go, that's the picture of the star-nosed mole that's been creeping me out all day. As I think when Jackie described the, um, the star-nosed mole, she, she wrote of it, 22 blood-engorged fleshy tentacles that radiate from its nostrils. And the image is no less kind of Lovecraftian than that. So um, welcome, Jackie. And... Big congratulations you. on the publication of your book. And it's a really fantastic achievement, extremely entertaining, extremely um, fascinating. And also I think incredibly um, timely as, as we will probably get to. Um, for example, you wrote an article which um, the title of which was um, the consequences of a year without touch or something like that. So obviously yeah. touch is a, one of the senses that, that, that was something um, that was sorry. In the Telegraph. That was a, an article I wrote for the Telegraph this this Sunday on um, the potential implications of our year without touch and and what it's meant for children predominantly, but all of us. Mm. Um, yeah, yeah. So that the the kind of COVID angle, the ways in which animal touch can reveal those sides of us, is something we'll get onto. But I thought I'd start. Um, our conversation with the opening line of the book, which is, we are often described as sentient beings, but what does that mean? So what does it mean, Jackie? Well, that's the million dollar question. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and it's a question that um, is open to philosophers as much as scientists. Um, I mean, I, I, I talk about the fact that it's a mercurial word um, that it comes from the Latin sentire to feel, um, but it means different things to different people. It's never really had a proper definition. Some people use it interchangeably with consciousness. Um, some people imagine it to be the lowest grade of consciousness or the kind of most basic form of consciousness. Um, and I, I do something different again. I, I was um, reading some Daniel Dennett who um, was talking about, if you imagine a sliding scale, you start with sensitivity and then you have kind of experience and then you have consciousness. Um, and he was looking for the kind of what would be the magic ingredient between um, sensitivity and um, experience. And, and the problem is we don't know what that magic ingredient is. He calls it the missing link or magic ingredient X. And, um, Marion Stamp Dawkins also was saying that, um, as a little quote I pulled out actually, sentience in ourselves and in other species is and remains the hard problem, harder than any other problem in biology and harder than some of us perhaps would like to admit. It's hard because we do not know what it is, where it comes from, what it does, 
or where to find it in other species. So consequently, I, um, I took a leaf out of Dennett's book when he said that we could also, you know, sentience covers everything from, from sensitivity through experience, through consciousness. So I take the line for this book that every creature on this planet is a sentient creature um, in, in terms of they sense the world. Um, mm. And from there, I then, I then, it's an investigation of how different creatures sense the world. And I use them to explore the way we sense the world. Um, yeah. <laughs> That, that's that's fantastic. I mean, um, <clears throat> I, I, I guess in a sense you don't try to answer the impossible questions, but you, you, you kind of show that maybe we have become desensitized to the nature of our sensitivity in the world. And it's through looking at other animals that these things become revealed. I mean, one of the things that you touch upon in the introduction, which I think is really interesting, is obviously we hear things like um, a sixth sense and that could sometimes mean um, in a slightly sort of spiritualist sense like mystical yes, perception or sometimes people may say well what about proprioception but I think overall most of us still operate largely with the Aristotelian millennia old taxonomy of five senses. Um, yeah. Your book like many um, recent books challenges that but I was wondering why, why do you think that Aristotelian um, taxonomy of touch, taste, smell, hear, and whatever the it's last so, one be, so um, has remained so stubbornly in place despite mm. this overwhelming critique of it in the last 20 years or more. I mean, we, we're all, I mean, I've, you know, I've got three kids and I've watched them all kind of troop back from nursery having, you know, parroting those five senses. So it's something that is inculcated in us at the very beginning. I mean, we, and we don't seem to question it. I mean, it's in, it is throughout throughout culture, but also in scientific papers, it, you know, you encounter the five senses. Um, I think perhaps, um, I mean, you know, there's a, you know, it's a bit like sentient, the word sentient and the kind of, you know, we can explore how one defines sentient, we can explore how one defines a sense. And so it depends on how you define a sense as to how many, what our tally is. So if you take um, sight, for example, um, and you look at, if you make the sensor, um, the the the, uh, the count of of um, of how many senses we have. Um, you've got on the back of your retina. You've got rods which enable you to see in the dark. Um, but then you've got three different types of color photoreceptor which enable you to you know see rainbows. So you could say either color photoreceptors, color sight is one, or maybe you could say there are four senses of, of sight. Um, touch is really complicated. One of my touch scientists described touch as um, the last great sensory frontier because our skin is full of different senses. You know, we've got, even, even when it comes to feeling, um, feeling the smoothness or the shape of something, we've got huge numbers of different types of senses that gauge different things. Um, you know, Merkel cells, Pacinian cells, Ruffini cells, you know, feeling the stretch of a glove, some, some respond to stretch, others to a light brush. Um, that's just understanding the lay of the land. But then you've also got sensors within your skin that tell you what temperature, whether something's hot or whether something's cold, or whether something's painfully cold or painfully hot. Um, you've got a pure reception, which is um, itch sensors. Um, you've got... Um, um, so these are more emotional types of touch and, and, and this touch sensor that we were talking about before we pressed click, which is this a, new, a relatively newly discovered um, sensor within the skin that scientists having found it had to figure out what it was for. And they, they learned that basically it fires when um, you're stroked at a certain speed between two and five centimeters a second with the temperature of skin on skin touch and with a light pressure. So this is the caress sensor. Mm. So, um, so sorry, I've gone off on one, but so how many, how many um, uh, touch sensors do we have? I mean, I, I kept it simple and I, I based it more on experience. So I have two chapters on touch. One is on 
discriminative touch, which is what scientists refer to when you're trying to understand the lay of the land, how the world feels according to your fingertips. And then affective touch, which is this idea of being touched and the emotions within touch, the pleasure, the pain. Another chapter. One told by the star and one told by the vampire bat. <laughs> Well, yeah, I, mean, I was so, um, really like. Um, I can't quite remember your question. Sorry. <laughs> no, I mean, it, it was it was just about the, the the original taxonomy, the the five senses, and the expansion. But as you've touched on touch, um, why don't we we go to to touch? So obviously, the the topic of touch allows you to introduce the first of your um, your animal characters for the evening, which would be the, the star-nosed mole, the one that we've talked about with its blood and gorge tendrils coming out of its nose. So what was it about the, um, the star-nosed mole that made it your choice of the exemplary creature to explore for your chapter on discriminative touch? Discriminative touch. Discriminative touch. <laughs> it's, well, he's, he's a creature that's impossible to resist. I mean, you described him as this kind of Cthulhu-like creature with tentacles. It's actually a little star, so star no small, a 22 tip star. And, um, and he's tiny, he fits in, your, in the palm of your hand. And um, I mean, he's, he's, um, he's extraordinary and bizarre. And there's a, a, there's a scientist called Ken Catania, who I spoke to, who is based over at Vanderbilt University over in Tennessee, who's dedicated huge man hours to understanding the star-nosed mole and his sensory world and his, his extraordinary abilities. Um, and, and part of deciding which animals I would follow would be, they can't just be exceptional, they had to be studied. And, and, and studies had to pertain to the senses. Um, so, the, the, you know, the, uh, my character shifted over time, but the star-nosed mole was, a, was an immediate hit because he's so extraordinary. And, and Ken has done some extraordinary work on him. So he's looked at that little star um, under um, a light microscope, a high powered light microscope. And then he's looked at it under an even more powerful electron microscope. And he's looked at what, what sensory structures are in, in that nose and um, found that essentially this mole has touch cells very much like the ones in our fingertips, like Merkel cells. They are Merkel cells. They share the same touch cells. But the extraordinary thing about star is that six times the sensitivity of my hand is essentially squeezed into a fingertip. So he's got exceptional um, touch acuity. Um, when he touches the world, the data that's coming back to kind of essentially um, create a tactile photograph, as it were, is really dense and um, full of information. Um, so he was, he, uh, he enabled me to talk about how we touch the world, how we use our fingers to feel shape and texture and um, size. Well, one of the, one of the if, if you like, the meta themes of the book, the, the themes that came up in recurrent chapters was, was this idea um, I'm not sure if synesthesia is exactly the right word, but this kind of mingling of the senses. So what you just said then about um, touch and, and feeling the world brought to mind one of the um, people you describe, a Turkish artist whose name I'm going to read phonetically, but I've probably got Ej it as well. Ejref. You, you, you can say it, you know what it is. So. Ej Ejref Armagan. Okay, so I mean, part of the, the thing that I, I guess his example is showing is this recurrent theme in your book about um, brain plasticity or the idea, as, as you put it, we do not hear with our ears, smell with our noses or taste with our tongues. So could you say something about um, Eshraf and, and why you used him as a paradigm of touch, but also sight at the same time? Time. And so he, so um, Eshraf, spoke to Eshref, um, but it, uh, uh, via Zoom, it was, it was a, a, um, an unusual conversation. And we had Joan next to him who was translating from English to Turkish. And anyway, he showed me how he draws, but he essentially has been blind since birth. Um, 
and he, he grew up in one of the poorer neighborhoods of Istanbul. And um, I think his parents ran a, a shop there and he would sit outside the shop so he didn't knock things around and kind of draw patterns in the sand. And people quite quickly said, you know, he, the conversation I think started between him and other people. And this was his way of engaging with the world, engaging with people. And he was drawing, but he wasn't seeing what he was drawing. And, he, and so he became an artist and he's a blind artist. And the way he, he draws the world is he feels it and then he translates it. But then of course, with his translation, he can't see what he's drawn either. Um, but to your point, um, he went to Harvard in 2004 and um, Harvard uh, neurologists scanned his brain while he was touching and drawing. And typically touch, when, when we're touching something as I'm touching this, the touch information travels from my fingers to a part of my brain called the somatosensory cortex, which is if I was wearing headphones, it would be a strip across here. And they saw that when Eshref was feeling the object he was about to draw, this somatosensory, this touch area would light up. It was processing the data that he... That, that. And, um, but in addition to that, the, um, the um, visual cortex was um, processing data too. And um, Alvaro Pascual Leone, who I talked to, who was part of the Harvard team that, that studied Eshref, said that had another neurologist just walked in to, um, into the scanning room and looked at the scan on, on, on the screen, they would say, um, you know, here's someone seeing something of a blind man. So this area in Eshref's brain did not lie fallow. It was co-opted by his sense of touch. And so this is, an ex this is exactly that. Our brains are so neuroplastic and so adaptable that you know, the brain doesn't hold still. It takes, it grasps what sensory information it can get hold of and it uses them, it processes them. And so when Estra found out that essentially um, he was using the visual part of this, this, the typically known visual part of his brain to process th this information, for him, it was proof that he could see. I mean, he says, mm. I see with my fingers. Mm. Um, so Pasquale Leone was saying, maybe maybe the, this area of the brain is um, the part of the brain that deals with spatial depth and dimension. So when our sight has gone and that root is closed off, you can still get space and depth and dimension through your fingers. And that's what's being processed. Um, so yeah, that, that's that's lovely. I mean, I guess there's another example you give in the chapter on um, hearing, which is ear sight. So, mm. um, could, could you say some something about mm. that? As again, this this kind of mixing of different sensory uh, modalities. Mm. So the that was the chapter on the great grey owl, which is this extraordinary large raptor um, that. Um, essentially can hear a mouse from 30 metres away, buried by 30 centimetres of snow or something like that, something extraordinary. Pristine mound of snow, so you know it's not using any other, it's not using vision, um, it's not using smell, um, it's using hearing. And, um, and I talk about with this creature, they have asymmetric ears, these, these owls. There's this wonderful video that you can look at online on the Teton Raptor Center, where there's a chap standing in a snowy place somewhere um, up in the Tetons, I guess, and pinioned beneath his arm is one of these massive raptors. And he shows you their ears, you know, he kind of peels apart their facial ruff. And just behind the facial ruff, you can see, you can see the ear. And the, the owl has this extraordinary thing, the ears are asymmetric. And this enables it also to um, not simply hear, but also pinpoint where that sound is coming from. And so, um, so similarly with barn owls and mice, you know, the, the, the night can be a blackout night, no moon, thick cloud, and yet still that barn owl can hear the mouse and hear where it is. So that's where the word ear sight came for, from with these creatures. And I, I, think, I think it's because we're very visually driven um, creatures ourselves that I suppose things like my use of a tactile photograph or um, I stole this idea of ear sight for the owl, 
Um, it is trying to, sight is so important to us. And for the owl, um, hearing has the same level of importance. And for the mole, the star-nosed mole, um, touch is its way, it's its main um, sensory um, clasp on the world. I mean, one of the things that I found most interesting in the book is um, how well we humans actually shape up. See, I guess you would imagine hearing what you said that the the um, the <laughs> great grey owl, great or gray owl. Was, hearing yeah. was maybe a thousand times more sensitive than ours, yeah. like a thousand times. But actually, what you say in it is that there's no reason to assume that it's hearing is actually better than ours, but it's actually to do with the shape of its plumage, I think, that allows it. And if you get if you gave it a crew cut, basically, it would have ah. roughly the same as us. Like scientists have done that, by the way. <laughs> OK, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Does that mean that if we strip the owl of its facial of its. So, yes. Yeah, so the inner ear, which is the business end of the ear. So sound essentially is the vibration of molecules. These molecules tickle our eardrum, the eardrum vibrates, little ossicle bones then, then tap on the cochlea and the cochlea is the business end of our ear. And inside that little snail shape is a little membrane and surrounded by endolymph fluid. The, the tapping causes a little wave through the fluid which excites these little hair cells. Now that's the same in us and it's the same in the, in the owl. Um, and our um, and and the scientists um, Christina Kopel um, has looked probably more than anyone at at owl cochleas and really analysed them. And in terms of um, um, in terms of sensitivity, there's not a huge amount of difference between an owl's cochlea and a human cochlea. Um, they have different um, frequency range hearing to us that they're able to hear at different scales. But generally, in, in a general, in, in the general term, and so scientists have basically our, our, our hearing is exceptional. But the mm. difference, the difference is, is that this facial rough, you know, the the, the owl's classic flat, flat, flat face. They don't have a ear like we do. This is our sound collecting device. Their whole face has become their sound mm. collecting device. So, so that's they're very good at plucking these sounds to excite their inner ear. So if we walked around with a Victorian um, ear trumpet on our ear, mm -hmm. um, we'd probably have the same hearing capacity as the Great Grey. We might hear that little mouse. <laughs> Seems well, extraordinary. I mean, I mean, but... an another one that came up was in the chapter on um, smell, um, which was the, the bloodhound, obviously the famous um, devoted bloodhound that sniffs out a wrongdoer over hundreds of miles. And in fact, again, even though earlier scientific studies suggested that the bloodhound's um, olfactory capacities were maybe, I think one of the figures you listed was 100,000 times stronger than ours. In fact, again, that's not actually, I mean, it may still be stronger, but I suppose the fascinating thing is that us humans are not kind of, if you like, 200 standard deviations below the, the yes. bloodhound. So I mean, the, the the study the study with the with the um with the dogs is really interesting. I mean that 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 myth started back in um the the 19th century with a chap called Paul Broca, mm. who um who had a fi fixation with brains and collected brains, and even on his death he asked for his brain to be put in a vat and stored. But he looked at the um the olfactory bulb in our brain. And, um, and basically thought proportionally, ours is smaller than all other creatures. So, from, so consequently, he thought that our olfactory um, bulb had shrunk to make way for our frontal lobes. And this idea that um, our smell had taken a back seat and free will and grander themes uh, 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 had, had taken, had taken um, um, precedence. And this was an idea that Sigmund Freud picked up on um, for him smell was um, um, basically as we became more civilized, we relied less on smell. So he thinks that smell is only interesting to children. He thought smell was only interesting to children or perverts or neurotic. Yeah, infantile. Um, um, but, the, but the new, so a chap called John McGann, we looked at, at um, Broca's studies and, and said, well, actually volume per volume, our olfactory bulb is still quite big. 
um, if, and it didn't shrink. And, um, and then there've been all sorts of behavioral studies, um, which I talk about in the book. The, the most, I think, extraordinary one was um, for me, was um, conducted by the Rockefeller um, smell, uh, universe, smell Study. Um, and I spoke to a chap called Andreas Keller who was involved in that. And they got people to um, um, basically discern, they, they put different scents in bottles and they asked people if they could somehow discern different scents from mixtures and then use some, some very clever mathematical modeling to work out how many different scents we could discern. And the number is staggering. Mm. Um, you yeah, know, I think, mm. No, no, I was just going to say, I remember some of the, the numbers. They were sort of, there was a, a particular number that I'd never heard before, which I heard was a um, quad, quadrillion or... Quad, so this is the, yes. The, well, Keller found, um, Keller found um, that we could distinguish over a trillion different scents. Um, and if you think of uh, colour, you know, if you ask most colour um, visual scientists how many colours we can discern, um, it's maybe a million, maybe more, but this, we're, talking, we're talking a whole leap ahead when it comes to smell. So we kind of forget how brilliant we are at smell. And we know from perfumiers or people who study wine that when we put our mind to it, mm. we're, 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 we can be rather brilliant. <laughs> Early on in the book, you, you do note, um, to use a quote of yours, we are guilty of underappreciating our sensory powers. And I, I guess what comes through is, as, as you said earlier, with people like Broca, um, may, maybe especially, but if, if you like, it fits in with an entire lineage of Western thinking that has prioritized sight. Like the idea is that as we got onto two feet, we move away from the ground, we move away from smell, we're not kind of sniffing around on the pavement like dogs but also we sort of move away from certain forms of touch and also I guess that vision has this distancing capacity so in a way um, touch emerges in your narrative as the most intimate of the senses but um, smell emerges as the most emotional and I was hoping you could say why there is this um, link between the, the olfactory sense and the emotional sense. Yes. So there was some, um, um, so, I mean, first of all, um, if, 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 your, if your nose snags a little airborne molecule and it gets, shoots up your, you inhale it and it ends up on your olfactory epithelium back here, it, there's only two synapses before it's reached um, your olfactory cortex. So smell is, is immediate. And um, most other senses um, pass through the thalamus, a, a gateway, but smell also hits very quickly our amygdala, which is our emotional cent center. And Rachel Hertz, um, another scientist, had written a book on our amazing, um, the sense of desire, and she's rebranded smell, this sense of desire. Um, and she even kind of um, takes Descartes' famous quote and, and says, I smell, therefore I feel. Um, and, even, and even wonders that if we couldn't smell, would we feel, would we have emotions? So smell really does, you know, instantly, um, um, it's, a very, it's a very emotive sense. Um, so that, yeah, that was a fun chapter. <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, um, it's interesting because the same, the same, um, if, if you like the, the enrichment of our sense worlds also happening in, philosophy as well as the kind of science areas you're like I've noticed that smells very much come back on the agenda touch has come back on the agenda so it's very interesting to see that the scientific community has been tracking this and it, it does seem that we have um, forgotten a lot of um, our potential as sentient beings perhaps because of a ocular centric or vision dominant society where most things is fed through the eyes. I was wondering if you would consider your book an attempt at kind of a rewilding of the senses. I mean, I'm not suggesting that you're proposing that we all go sniffing around on the ground like blood. <laughs> but there's a feeling in which you're kind of saying, this is our heritage. This is where our senses have come from. And this is the potential that we have, which we're not. Yes. Um, and, and perhaps that links with things like um, alienation. And I guess that comes through with um, COVID and the loss of 
touch, the loss of, um, I suppose early you, you distinguished between discriminatory touch and was it emotive touch or affective touch? Affective. Um, affective, so obviously... affective touch is the phrase, but emotional touch, yes, emotional touch. Yeah, I mean, I, I, um, I, mean, I like this idea of your, your idea of rewilding the senses. Um, I think that, I mean, there was, a, there was a quote at the very beginning. So Richard Dawkins, um, there was a quote that, that I picked up on from his book, Unweaving the Rainbow. So he was my, my tutor back in the day when I studied zoology. Um, and he had this idea of um, how familiarity dulls the senses and anesthetizes us to the wonder of existence. And, and, you know, our sensory experience is so mundane, it's so everyday, it's every waking moment, that, um, that I think we need to kind of stop and unpick it a little bit in order to appreciate how marvelous it is. Mm. And this is, he, he talks about, we can recapture the sense of having just tumbled out on life by looking at it from another angle. And so the other angle I used were these creatures um, who, who, who sense the world in similar ways to us. And by, through them, I, and I thought that we would get some distance on ourselves and realize that, that we are rather spectacular. Mm. Um, so it's quite joyful, really. I mean, it's, it's, um, it is, um, and, I, and I like that idea of rewilding. It's not that we're tapping into senses that we um, didn't that 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 have that have remained dormant inside us. These senses are working. It's just that we're not giving them attention. You know, we're just not noticing them. I think. Mm. I, I think again with with smell. One of the things you pick up on, which is obviously interesting from a philosophical point of view, is that in in areas like smell, there's things working at more of a subconscious level. It may hijack our sense of autonomy. So one of the chapters which I found most interesting because I, I think when I thought of pheromones, I thought of um, tacky vending machines in men's toilets or whatever. <laughs> Actually, it turns out that there's a real serious, and in fact, I think you quoted some scientists as saying pheromones is one of the great unsolved problems of, of modern science. So I was hoping you could say a little bit about um, the way I, I think it, it was a moth. Was it the great, the great, the great peacock moth? I had to get um, this marvelous French entomologist in there, Fab, um, who had done this extraordinary experiment where he he put a, a bell jar, a, a gauze jar, over a female moth, and these moths release pheromones, and um, you know, male moths come flocking to her. It's a, it's a really lovely. Um, um, piece of writing by Fabre. But essentially, um, the first pheromone that was discovered was discovered in the domesticated silk moth. A chap called Adolf Buttenhant back in the 1950s um, discovered this chemical compound that essentially hijacks the male's brains and gets them to fly wherever that scent path is leading. Um, and the word, you know, he and colleagues coined the term pheromone, a carrier of excitement. Um, and so, so, so there is there is science with regard to um, since that's happened, pheromones have been found in nearly, you know, all animal groups ever since. So there's there is a the, the, and there's been lots of studies about whether humans um, use pheromones and lots of tantalizing work, which I, I, I describe. Mm. Um, but whenever it comes to humans, because the power of the pheromone is actually quite scary, this idea that somehow we are inhaling these scentless scents or odorless odors, and without us realizing, they're hijacking some aspect of our free will, they're controlling us. It's such a kind of loaded idea that the the, the 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 science needs to be um, um, uh, Tristan Wyatt, who I spoke to, who studies pheromones in, in the animal kingdom, said that what we need to do with these experiments is do what Buttenhand had done back in the fifties, whereby he isolated that pheromone and then recreated it and checked to see whether the recreated one would still pull in the, the male moths, and that would be the gold standard for for, for isolating the first female, uh, sorry, the first human pheromone, and we could ditch the word putative. Mm. Um, but we're, we're coming close. I mean, I think that um, that perhaps the most promising um, 
um, human uh, potential for, for, for finding human pheromones is not between couples, actually. Although my chapter is about the sense of desire and it's about how smell operates between couples, both consciously but also subliminally. Um, but this is between what comes of their coupling. And um, mothers um, release, um, um, th th there's some evidence to suggest that mothers are releasing pheromones that enable babies to breastfeed. Um, and perhaps that's going to be, Tristan Wyatt thinks that that's going to be where the first um, human pheromone is shown for sure, cast iron. That's very interesting. I suppose the, um, the working theory of your book is that if it's found in the animal world, there is likely to be some trace bit. We, we haven't le left these things behind, even if um, the shape of our sense world may have been dominated by um, the kind of thinkers who would prefer to think of us as highly rational, highly conscious creatures who are not susceptible to these, um, as you say, these scentless scents that hijack our um, consciousness. So again, I think that's a very interesting part of the narrative of the book is that um, there is so much that's emotional or intimate that has been largely overlooked in this focus on, on vision. But I thought as we're approaching the time when we should turn to questions, there were two kind of big questions, which unfortunately I think will only allow for small answers. But the second half of your book is where you veer away from the, what we would call the five classic senses in the Aristotelian one. And, and, and it's to what you call the um, secret senses. Yes. I was hoping you could just say something about why you use that phrase and what some of these senses, what, what examples are, are there? So that's, that's another reason why Aristotle's counted five. There are senses that we all use, but they are working beneath our conscious radar. Um, I stole the term secret sense from Oliver Sacks. It's how he describes a chap walks into his um, surgery and he's an elderly chap and he's walking at a tilt. And he says, I'm called the Leaning Tower of Pisa. Um, my friends call me the Leaning Tower of Pisa. I don't know what's gone wrong. And um, so Oliver Sacks recounts a story whereby he has to film this gentleman to prove that he is walking at a tilt. And he, he explains to um, this gentleman that he's basically something's gone wrong with his sense of balance. Um, and so balance is one of these secret senses. It enables us to stand up, um, to walk, um, we're using it all the time. It's part of our um, inner ear. Um, it's operating all the time silently within us. Mm. And one of the themes again of the book is we often only know something, um, we only recognize or, or value something after it's gone wrong. So, mm. so throughout the book, we meet people like, uh, like Sax's gentleman, but other people where senses have misfired and then you realize what an extraordinary role this sense plays in uh, in, in um in in our day-to-day -day. yeah and, and again I, I think that some of the most interesting things is the ways in which um the eyes and the ears are implicated in far more than we think so for example you you report something called time blindness which yes. is and so if you like our inner sense of time or our circadian rhythms are mediated by the eyes and that's yeah. Something that would be intuitively obvious at all. So, so another, so that there was another chap who I who I talked to called Mark Threadgold, who back in 1999 suffered a terrible injury. He was um, part, he was in um, the British Army, and he lost his eyes. And um, he started straight. He, um, as well as being blind, he realised that something odd was afoot with regards to time. He started slipping with regard to time. So. He took, it first became obvious to him, he was, it, um, he was out of hospital, he was living in a rehabilitation centre, and he had a talking clock, which would tell him the time, and he had a snooze after tea, and then he, he woke up and thought, crumbs, I've slept in too late, I've slept through the night, he asked the clock what time it was, it's 11 o'clock, so he rushed to get downstairs for breakfast, and the place was eerily quiet, there was no one there, he felt quite discombobulated went back upstairs and when he checked with the clock, he realized it was 11 p.m. Hmm. So he, he, he basically was diagnosed by, by this chap, Russell Foster, with something called time blindness, which scientists didn't even know existed. Um, Russell dis discovered another sensor on the back of the eye, which 
he came across huge amounts of reluctance from the scientific community to accept this because he's one of those heretics. I he's one of the heretics. Yeah. He he um you know ophthalmologists thought that of all the organs in the human body, the eye was the most the best understood. And so to, to propose to them that they completely missed an entire photoreceptor was, was well, they put their nose out of joint. So he, mm. he didn't have the best reception, but he proved, he, he now um, runs um, the Nuffield Laboratory of Ophthalmology at Oxford. So you, his science is past iron and he, he's woof. <laughs> um, but he, 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 um, he, he consequently, um, you know, invented or kind of realized this, this, um, this condition of time blindness. And we now know that if someone's blind, they must still spend time in the sun to entrain their, their, all their body clocks to the passing of night and day to get them into the circadian rhythm that, that um, we're all in because naturally it's happening again subconsciously we're keyed into the, the daily rhythm. But if you put us in a cave for three months, we too will start spiraling out of, our, mm. out of this daily rhythm. This is the cave. Fascinating. And, and there were so many more that I wish we could talk about, like oh. the controversial oh. hypothesis that we have an internal compass that allows us to navigate, like, like the birds that you give the example of. And it may come up in questions, but I think it's definitely time to turn to the audience questions. So. Um, one of the questions that's come in is, um, which animal that you wrote about would you say is the most human-like in its consciousness or sentience? Do you know, I deliberately avoided the primates. Um, I just thought that would be too, too, too easy, too obvious. I purposefully chose creatures that were actually rather different to us. Um, because although I don't answer what is sentience, I couldn't possibly, but I'm exploring it and um, problematizing it. Um, so the last chapter, I might flip the question and say that the last chapter is about the octopus, which is a mollusk. So physiologically has more in common with a trout than it does a mammal. And yet um, people readily ascribe it with sentience because it appears to have sentience because it's so intelligent. You know, they. They recognize faces. I mean, everyone's seen my octopus teacher, maybe, or maybe not, you should, it's wonderful. But they recognize faces, they're brilliant at you know, solving mazes. They can unscrew caps from both inside and outside bottles. They can tackle childproof caps that bamboozle me. Um, they escape from their tanks. Um, I mean, there are all sorts of amazing, amazing stories. So here's an example of a sentient creature that could not be more different to us. So um, scientists, in fact, Peter Godfrey Smith also wrote a wonderful book and would argue, I would argue that, you know, evolution effectively made brains, uh, minds, minds twice, um, mm. because this is so distant from us, this creature. It's almost like meeting an alien on, on earth. Um, so it's sentient, I would, I would argue it's, it's, well, in my parsimonious version, it's certainly sentient. But in the more, um, it, it, it's also accepted that it's sentient in, in, in the less, you know, the, the idea of basic consciousness at the very least. Um, yeah. Thank you. So um, Keith asks, do you draw on any examples from a marine environment? And I suppose I have to take some responsibility for choosing a lot of land creatures. Because actually I looked through and there's about half a dozen. There's the peacock, yeah. the shrimp, peacock, the spook, man, the shrimp, the spook fish, the which is wonderful. Fish, yeah. The, um, octopus and finally is does the duckbell platypus live in water a little bit it's sort of in and out in and out but anyway <laughs> is there any particular thing you'd like to say to Keith about um, the ways in which marine environments and the creatures within can reveal something? I loved my spookfish story um, you know this creature that's living down in these bathypelagic inky bathypelagic inky depths and and I use the spookfish um, it's a newly discovered fish. They thought it had four eyes. It looks like it's got four eyes. It's actually got one pair of eyes, but they're, it's called the four-eyed spookfish. It's, but, it's, um, but it's just got all these tricks that enable it to pick up the few photons of light that are down there, that enable it to have some 
um, form of sight. Now, what that experience is, who knows? You know, I, I was asking Ron Douglas, who, who was one of the scientists who discovered it. Um, um, I was like, you know, what, what's it like to see through the eyes of this creature? And he kind of steers, scientists tend to steer clear of these subjective experience questions. You know, he starts telling me, well, this, you know, he'll talk about how the eye's working, but then what's, what the experience is, he'll, he'll steer clear of. But um, that, that, was a, that was a lovely story. And, and through that, I talked about our incredible night vision and how our eyes are really rather exceptional at seeing even a photon, mm. not seeing, but detecting. But there's ex an extraordinary um, experiment that took place in Vienna that was really testing the limits, the threshold of human vision. What is the least amount of light we need to see or, 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 what, or, or the least amount of light that we can detect. Um, so that was a fun story. And the shrimp was a great story too, but ah, that's the first story in the book. Yeah, the, the shrimp with its kind of incredible um, kind of attraction to color. Um, color. Actually, one of the interesting things is this, um, the kind of extremities, because in the chapter on hearing you refer to John Cage who says where's the quote there is no such thing as silence what you're talking about about picking up on one photon another um yeah quote which I really found very interesting was this idea that we can hear zero decibels yes so decibels is a confusing measurement it's logarithmic but yes it our hearing is exceptional so when when um, scientists are looking at the senses they quite often do threshold experiments to work out what's the least that we can smell. You know, we did that with the bloodhound. Um, um, you know, how few photons can we see? Yes, it's what's the very, how sensitive are, are our senses? Absolutely. So um, one, of the, one of the questions which I think touches on, on, on this idea is from Connie, possibly a relation of yours because you share the same surname. <laughs> Connie says, when reading your book, which I love by the way, I was struck by your focus on disrupted or lacking sense. So I suppose that's the Oliver Sacks style. What drew you to the study of this phenomenon as opposed to simply extraordinary sense? So yeah, I think she's right to pick up on the two extremes. You've got um, creatures with the most profound or extraordinary version of something. And then you've also got creatures, generally humans, who've lost a particular capacity. So yes. And particularly with the secret senses, you know, unless you've lost something, you might not realize this extraordinary thing that it does for us, whether it's blindness to time or I, I, I met um, a chap called Ian Waterman who'd lost his sense of body, this sense that when you close your eyes, um, you know, you know where your body is in space, you know, to the degree that you can operate it brilliantly. Um, it's, the real name's proprioception. Um, and Ian unfortunately had a nasty viral attack of some, some nasty virus and it wiped out his sense of proprioception. So he, he lost his body essentially. You know, he woke up on a hospital bed feeling like he was floating up above the bed, had a hand on his face and then realized that hand was his hand. Mm. And then realized he couldn't feel anything from, and I tell his story and his extraordinary story of how he hadn't lost motion, but he'd lost control of motion. So when his eyes were turned, his, his hand would be doing something that he wasn't aware of. So I tell, the, tell his story of how he had to relearn human motion and his eyes took the role of proprioception for us. But each day for him is a daily marathon of absolute mm. rigorous attention, which we, we're moving, we're doing all this without even thinking. So he was a good example of, um, of uh, uh, he, he, he's, he, he shows very readily what this sense does for us. I mean, it was a horrific story having to read about, I mean, basically having to perform all these actions in a conscious visual way, which we take for granted and how granted. wearying that was. But amazingly, he's kind of, he does it and he's still at it. So he's the most extraordinary man, story. remarkable. Remarkable and incredibly optimistic and <laughs> loved being compared to the octopus. <laughs> Call me Inky, he said. Um, he's, 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 uh, he's wonderful. So there was actually a question that came up about proprioception from Bill, who um, 
asks, would you comment on the blind artist's use of proprioception and that what we call the visual cortex might be mostly about our ability to perform spatial or 3D modeling and that the visual part in quotation marks just forms the primary but not the only input for that? Um, I'm sure proprioception is part of Eshref's talent. Um, but I wonder, um, yes, I mean, I'm sure it's, and I'm sure it's, it, I'm, 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 sh I'm sure, but I, but I don't know the ins and outs. I mean, I don't know whether the scientists studied it either, but I can't believe it wouldn't be. Um, it's such a kind of vital sense that's with us all the time. Um, um, yeah, sorry, I haven't, I, 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 yeah. I mean, it was, it was quite a technical question. So um, it, it's, it's sorry, one, Bill. probably <laughs> the actual scientists would, would, have um but whether there's been studies i don't know yeah so this is a question from sonia who asks um and actually one of the things and i said at the beginning there was this this real relevance to your book in relation to covid because obviously there's been this grand social experiment of living without or with significantly diminished affectionate touch. But in addition, one of the symptoms of COVID is the loss of, of smell. So Sonia asks, um, the sense of smell is so closely tied to emotion. So what does this mean for people with anosmia? Has this been studied, people who presumably lost the sense of smell on a permanent basis? Yeah, I had COVID back in January and I also lost my sense of smell. It was horrible. Um, and it was quite emotionally discombobulating. Um, you know, my coffee in the morning was, was just kind of insipid brown water and my chocolate, my two go-to substances that give me pleasure <laughs> were like, um, the chocolate was like a kind of fatty dough in my mouth. It was horrible. Um, I think people who, I, I talk about um, anosmia in the book and, and it does lead to depression. I mean, it's often associated with depression um, people become paranoid that they're not smelling certain things that they should smell. Um, um, some people eat to try and satisfy something that they're not receiving. Um, and some people don't eat because food becomes like dough. So it's, it's, um, it does have a, a definitely has an emotional knock on effect, um, anosmia. Yeah, I mean, it, it's interesting. There's also the the thing like the famous um, Proust example of smelling the the Madeleine biscuit Madeleine. being pulled, yeah. pulled back. So I suppose a lot of the capacity for emotional memory would also be lost in the absence of of smell. So again, it's it's sort of one of those. I mean, as, as you say in the well, did Proust the talk about the taste or the smell? Because that's also interesting. I thought it was the taste. I can't remember. Sort of, um, it could well have been the taste. Yeah, I, I had it in my I, head. But I think well, so. The, but but it's uh, well. I, I but the reason I say that is because another another um, people often. Um, I mean, basically, most of what we think of as taste is actually smell. So when you have a really nasty head cold, um, you get that kind of doughy, you know, plasticine in your mouth. A lot of what we um, basically. Um, we chew on something, the molecules float back up into our nose through the retronasal passage, it's called. And the, um, and, and the, and the flavor of something is predominantly a smell, um, but we're hoodwinked, our brain hoodwinks us into thinking that we're tasting it on the tongue, but in fact, we're smelling it in the nose. Mm. Um, so again, we, we don't taste with our tongue. But it would have been flavour that Proust was talking about, but we, mm. again, we use flavour and taste interchangeably, not quite knowing what's what. Taste is a very simplistic, it's, it's um, salt, sour, sweet, you know, it's all, it's, it's four, maybe five with Unami um, receptors, much, much more parsimonious. Mm. So this, this uh, interesting question from Zach, I suppose, on the... Um, impact of writing the book it's have you found that having such detailed awareness of the processes underlying our sensory functions has altered your immediate experience of um, of the senses of life of the world and if so how yes without doubt I mean every chapter that I was 
working on, I would become fixated by. So whether I was walking my dog and imagining what he was smelling and just taking time to smell. Um, or when the senses started going wrong, you know, waking up one morning thinking, oh, my balance isn't working quite right. You know, my hypochondriac. Yeah, you're, you're <laughs> very, very dangerous for a hypochondriac. Yeah. It shows you how much can really go wrong, so. But I think the, uh, what if, I would be really thrilled if someone read the book and just slowed up a little bit and started to dissect their, you know, ultimately our perception is a multi-sensory experience. It's feeding off all these different things. But if we just slow up and think about, you know, how we're smelling something, how we're feeling, all this extraordinary um, ability that, that, that are unfolding within us, I think that would be a nice, um, um, note. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, I thought I'd end with um, by touching on something that is a, a theme in the book, especially towards the end, a really interesting one. And um, potentially we were talking earlier about the possibility of a follow up book, but it, it's kind of got this um, dot, dot, dot at the end. It's about um, what's, um, I suppose, the sort of the technological interaction with our senses. So you quote the scientist David, neuroscience David Eagleman, who says that the result of, like, for example, one of the things you say is that increasingly we're hacking or um, working out the senses, for example, we may be able to undo our circadian rhythms. And, and, and so there's this sense in which um, technology is um, denaturalizing us. But what Eagleman says in this kind of quite grand phrase is, we now only need to ask, how do we want to experience our universe? Well, I was wondering what you thought of this kind of techno-scientific perspective on our sensory world. So I, um, I mean, essentially it's all because of our incredibly neuroplastic brains that we can feed them stimuli that our sensory organs are not tuned to pick up. So take the platypus, this is in the chapter on the platypus that has an electric sense unless the electricity is sufficiently at high amplitude we, and we feel pain, we don't sense electricity, but, um, we, but we could. I mean, we could implant sensors that enable us to sense electricity. And there are people out there, these biohackers who are trying to create an augmented human that can maybe sense uh, magnetic fields or, electric, or electricity. So it's, so it's really interesting. I mean, I... Um, uh, for me, what interests me is looking at the animals um, that have all these exceptional senses and those should lead the way. They're, they're, the, the animal kingdom is full of inspiration in terms of how it, um, umwelt is the term that we, mm. the, that we were talking about. We all have a different experience of the world depending on what we sense. And their umwelts are, you know, so extraordinary. So I would, I, my, so when we're talking neurotechy talk, I would bring it back to the animal kingdom and get them to, to lead the way. And then maybe we could know what life is like for a star-nosed mole or for a bat. 